six verses was just about enough to learn that one. <laughs> Blessed be the one holy and living God. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things which are of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Job. There was once a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. One day, the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still persists in his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. Then Satan answered the, the, answered the Lord, Skin for skin, all that people have they will give to save their lives. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well, he is in your power. Only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and inflicted loathsome sores on Job from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Job took a potsherd and to, with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak like, as any foolish woman would speak. 
Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Tiffany by whole verse, that means that one side of the church will read the first verse and the other side of the church will answer with the second and so on, beginning on this side. Give judgment for me, O Lord, for I have lived with integrity. I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered. For your love is before my eyes. I have walked faithfully with you. I have hated the company of evildoers. I will not sit down with the wicked. singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and recounting all your wonderful deeds. Do not sweep me away with sinners, nor my life with those who thirst for blood. As for me, I will live with integrity. Redeem me, O Lord, and have pity on me. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he spoke to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but somehow someone has testified somewhere what are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now, in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Some Pharisees came, and to test him, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So the topic of our gospel today and the topic of today's sermon is divorce. And right up front, I want to say that I am going to emphasize love, caring, and compassion and not judgment in the face of divorce. Today's gospel starts with the Pharisees coming to test Jesus. A side note on these Pharisees, an important side note, the Pharisees are not the bad guys. Jesus was very close to the Pharisees, both in his preaching, his teaching, and in his thinking. He had a lot in common with them. In this case, the Pharisees are the authorities, the people protecting the status quo, and they wanted to know who this Jesus was and whether he could be trusted. So they came and they tested him on his interpretation of Scripture, and they asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? This is a serious test for Jesus. Divorce has always been a complicated and painful subject. In the best of all possible worlds, every marriage would be beautiful and life-giving. But we all know that that is not always true. In every age, Divorce has been a complicated, difficult problem. Every society and every religion struggles with divorce. Jesus' answer to this question was important then, and it continues to be important to us today. Anyone who has been touched by divorce, and who hasn't, knows the pain, loss, and destruction that divorce leaves in its wake. 
most of us also know that divorce can actually be healing and allow for new life, new growth, new love. This is a delicate subject. The Pharisees challenged Jesus to take a legal stand. How do you read the law of Moses? How do you interpret and apply the law? And Jesus answers them very carefully, sidestepping the legal debate with a more expansive reading of Scripture. That's why he references the Torah the way that he does. They ask what is lawful, and he responds with what is life-giving. Let me give you a little bit of context for the debate that they're asking Jesus to participate in. Divorce was, of course, a very controversial subject in their time as it is today. And two of the most important scholars of that era had famously debated whether a man could divorce his wife. They were Hillel and Shammai. They analyzed the Hebrew scriptures down to the level of the syllables of individual and particular words. Hillel argued, based on the first syllable of this particular word, that a man could write a divorce, a, 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 a certificate of divorce, for almost any reason. He's famous for having said that even for something as trivial as having burned the breakfast, a man can write a certificate of divorce, of dismissal and divorce his wife. Shammai, emphasizing a different syllable of that particular word, argued that divorce could only be allowed in the most extreme of circumstances, in the most flagrant and extreme cases of infidelity, could divorce be allowed. Now, this is not a trivial debate. These were serious scholars and theologians using their best tools and best arguments to grapple with an important issue. And that's the debate that the Pharisees want Jesus to step into so that they can test him, so they can understand where he stands. And Jesus, rather than debating what constitutes just cause for divorce, made the case for honoring relationship. Relationship. I mean, what is spirituality but the honoring of relationship, relationship with the sacred, relationship with one another. Again, Jesus' argument is not about what is legal, but what is life-giving. Why does this matter? Divorce is devastating to families but particularly to a mother and her children who could be cut off from economic and social, um, even familial support in the case of a divorce. We know this. Even today, we have great admiration for the woman who manages to support her family and raise her children well, and have a career to support her family. All of this, we, we look up to such women. We admire them. Now, just imagine how much harder it would have been in ancient times when there were fewer options available for a woman to support her family. To really understand Jesus' position, to really get why what he's talking about is about what is life-giving versus what is legal. We have to look at what comes next in the story. What comes next in the gospel reading? People were bringing little children to Jesus so that he might touch them. And why did he touch 
Why would he touch someone? Well, to heal them or to bless them. So in the face of a debate about power and privilege, Jesus takes a small child, the least of us, the least powerful and the least privileged, and says, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. This is the third time that Jesus has responded to a conflict over power and privilege by blessing or healing a child. Jesus places a child, a marginalized, powerless, voiceless person among the disciples and says, start here. This is where you will find eternal life, abundant life, true life, kingdom of God life, life energized by God's spirit, life created and shaped by God's love. Three times Jesus uses a child to make his point. The first time was back when Peter rebukes Jesus after he has predicted his own arrest, death, and resurrection. Peter, of course, wanted Jesus to be a powerful Messiah, to reestablish a powerful kingdom for Israel, to drive the Romans out. And here is Jesus saying instead that he will be a suffering Messiah, pointing the way to a new kind of life. Jesus rebuked Peter and told the crowds that they would have to take up their cross and die to their expectations in order to follow him. And then he healed a boy whom the disciples had been unable to heal. The second time comes again after Jesus foretells his own death and resurrection, and then they're walking on the way from one place to another, and as they walk, the disciples were arguing about who was the greatest, who was the most important disciple, who would sit at Jesus' right hand. So Jesus said, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And he placed a small child among them, hugged the child, and said, when you welcome a child like this, you welcome me. And when you welcome me, you welcome the one who sent me. And for a third time, when the Pharisees set out to test Jesus, to take his measure on issues of interpretation, he again turns to the children and he blesses and heals them. Jesus says that it is here with the marginalized and the powerless that you will find your way to God. Today's gospel is not about the legality of divorce. Jesus is not proclaiming a new legal standard. Jesus is calling us into loving relationship with God and with one another. He is saying, essentially, you may think this is about legal interpretation, but I say that all of life is about caring for those in need, for the least of these, for a child, or for a divorced woman. So what does Jesus' teaching on divorce look like in real life? What does it look like when we live it out? Blessed are you if you have been hurt by divorce. Blessed are you if you are a child of divorce. Blessed are you if you have fled a marriage because of abuse or infidelity. Blessed are you if you have had to rebuild your life after divorce. Blessed are you if you live every day with anger over a divorce. 
Blessed are you if you have found love after divorce. Jesus is not judging. Jesus is blessing. Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. We continue with the Nicene Creed on page 5 of the bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our prayers will include the thanksgivings and intercessions you wrote on our prayer list as you came into the church today. Please add your own prayers silently or aloud when invited. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. 
comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. We pray especially today for Susan A., Teresa M., Mary B., Elisha, Pam S., Doris E., Andy, Shonda, Pam and Jim B., John and Tim, Amy Y., Michael Seth and Annette, for Phil, Lisa, Pat, Nicola, Bill, Teresa, and Tricia. And for these others, we now name silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for birthdays, anniversaries, and all the blessings of this life, especially for a new family member, Izzy, birthday for Rick R. and Robin. And for these others, we now name silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom, remembering today Tim, Ronnie, Andrew, and Vishnu. And for these others, we now name silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives, we have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of Christ be always with you. Welcome, welcome to uh, Good Samaritan Church, and uh, today 
October 6th is the first Sunday after October 4th, which is the feast day of St. Francis, our most wonderful of saints. And Francis, uh, one of the things that Francis inspires us to is our love of animals and nature. And today at three o'clock in the courtyard at the labyrinth, we will hold a small service for the blessing of animals. Um, I don't know what kinds of animals we will have, um, but it's always interesting. It's mostly dogs, every once in a while a cat, but I've seen tarantulas and snakes and hedgehogs and all kinds of interesting animals worthy of blessing. So that's a fun service that I, that I invite you to come back for at three o'clock today. Um, and this evening at 7 p.m. is the first of our Compline services of the year, a beautiful contemplative service. Um, you can just come at any way uh, and pray in any way that feels comfortable to you as we sing, we being the choir, sings the service entirely for you in Gregorian chant. Uh, a beautiful service, I commend that to you, 7 p.m. this evening. And you have an announcement, Mary. It's bring your own microphone day. Thank you, Sarah, for leading our godly play. I, I love godly play. I, it, it's not just teaching kids the stories of the Bible. That's important, teaching kids the stories of the Bible. But that moment that she referred to, the moment of wondering, when, they, when we stop and we say, I wonder, I wonder what that means to us today. I wonder, I wonder where the good news is in this gospel reading about divorce. I wonder, I wonder where the good news is in the book of Job. Things, wonder is what brings us into contact with the depth and meaning uh, that's available to us in scripture. So thank you, Sarah, for that ministry. Now, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, however you found your way into this place, whether you are rich or poor, whatever the color of your skin, whomever you love, whatever your abilities, you are welcome here and you're welcome at this table. There is food enough for all. Come.
and be fed. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It 
It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son, for in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death. We proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection unto your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen.
And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. For the people of God, behold what you are, become what you receive.
Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.